Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another very special episode of the Catholic Talk Show. Today, we're going to be talking about what Jesus actually experienced during the crucifixion. Yeah, we're going to look at the signs of crucifixion, what the human body experiences, and what our Lord experienced while suffering his crucifixion on the cross. And he truly suffered for our salvation. So I hope that this episode will help open up your mind and heart to conceive the great sufferings of our Savior. All right, guys. Good to be here with you guys during Holy Week um, for this episode. Yeah. Father Rich, Ryan. Ryan, you know, Good Friday, whenever it rolls around every year, is always such a somber and silent day. And even to consider and liturgically as, as your priest processes in and prostrates in silence and, and, you know, the consideration of what crucifixion means, what the sacrament of priesthood means, you know, Jesus Christ, the high priest, laid down his life for our salvation. And that is what is so good about this very particular day where we recognize he is that atoning sacrifice and he left his own body and blood on the cross to die for us, to show that self offering and a self deposit of love is what we have the capacity for in our own particular priesthood that we share in our baptism. So I'm very, I'm very, you know, uh, intentionally uh, open to talking about this even more and really coming to understand a little bit more scientifically what Jesus actually went through leading up to the Garden of Gethsemane and then what he experienced in his sufferings leading up to his death on the cross. Yeah, I, I would say that a, uh, just a little warning for everybody who's going to listen or watch this episode. Um, crucifixion is not a pretty thing, and there is going to be some graphic detail of what our Lord experienced. And I think it is very beneficial for people to hear it. But for people who might have a real um, difficulty, you you might want to consider uh, that before listening further on this episode. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we're going to go into detail. And as I mentioned, you know, when we when we conceive of Jesus's suffering. It should always be an occasion of recognizing how much he loved us and how much that love continues to pour out into the world. You know, it is unfathomable mercy, as St. Faustina describes, what happens on the cross. And that is the very pinnacle moment of when Jesus deposited his life. And, yeah. and that's something that we celebrate <laughs> still today, but it's something we celebrate every single mass. And the Paschal mystery and Jesus's, you know, victimhood is very present to the prayer, prayer life of the church. So to, to get a better understanding of that, hopefully this episode will be able to assist in that process. Yeah. I mean, the Romans were absolute masters at torture and the crucifixion was designed for maximum torture and to inflict a maximum amount of pain and a maximum amount of humil of humiliation on a person. And that's what our Lord experienced on the cross. Yeah, mm -hmm. I look at, like, you know, as we dive into this further, I, I, I consider a couple things, too, that, that really are just an imprint on my soul. One is obviously the passion, the movie The Passion. It was really the first time I ever encountered this brutality, um, you know, however legitimate that is uh historically but it seemed to be you know based on what what i've heard um you know and 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 how that's always stuck with me and and you know how it just really uh, poured out uh this just amazing thing that god could have done anything to reveal himself for us and to do this for us to show us just how much he loves us is just uh, unfathomable like mm -hmm. you said and then the other thing is, uh, you know, visit to the Holy Land and and to walk uh, the Via Crucis and and um, experience that. You know, those two things really were were I think instrumental in um, my uh, spirituality during this time. You know, mm -hmm. you know the the Passion of the Christ was actually based on a vision of a Saint uh, Saint Catherine and Anne Emmerich. Emmerich. Yeah, uh, it was a book called The Dolores Passion of Our Lord, I think. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the details that you wouldn't, that are not recorded in the gospel uh, of that movie, at least come from that vision. But looking at the, the historical 
record of what we still have as far as artifacts um, from Roman times, it would have been very likely the case that it was absolutely every bit that brutal and eviscerating uh, what our Lord experienced. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you know, the, the thing I'm going back and forth on is, you know, the crucifix is always so central to the design of a church building and it's always central in the sanctuary. And some parishes have, you know, a, a depiction of the crucifixion and, you know, it's important to look at, you know, I'm, I'm thinking even of the one in my, in my sanctuary, it only has a little bit of blood, but when you consider the, the, the artistic uh, depictions of the crucifixion in Spain, for example, I mean, that is a whole nother level of a reality check mm -hmm. of what actually happened. I have this beautiful picture that, that was given to me by sisters, the Trinitarian sisters of San Diego, their mother house in Tecate. They have this huge life-size statue of Jesus after the scourging. And you just see the open wounds and the gaping wounds of Christ. And it is so striking that it moves you to silence and prayer. And you'll sit there kneeling and, and prayer and just really reflect on like, oh my goodness, you know, yeah. it, it just moves you. It just absolutely moves you. But to think that, you know, from the very, very beginning, from the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus was experiencing some type of medical condition. And recently, um, the Azusa uh, Pacific University, uh, a few years back, did a little study. And I know that we're going to enter into another study, but goes into detail about Jesus uh, and, and, you know, the drops of blood that, was, that he was sweating. And there's a rare medical condition called hemohydrosis, during which the capillary blood vessels that feed the sweat glands break down, blood released from the vessels mixes with the sweat, therefore the body sweats literally drops of blood. And it, it's amplified by a condition from mental anguish or high anxiety. And this is emphasized in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26, 38, where Jesus says, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Now we know that Jesus was deeply grieved all throughout his public ministry. He had moments of great grief, but this is grief to the point of death. And we can see that Jesus is entering in to a mental state of high anxiety on our behalf. And look how much anxiety is in the world. And, and we're talking about high anxiety and depression and to realize that Jesus entered into that state on our behalf and all throughout these various stages of crucifixion and the, the suffering that Jesus went through leading up to his death, it's important to realize he did that for our sake. And whenever we're suffering, we should be pairing our suffering with his. So as you listen to these various stages, you know, to, to maybe take moments of, of prayerful reflection, you know, Jesus wants to commune with you in your personal suffering, what you feel that is so overwhelming in your life right now. Truly pair that with Christ and move closer to him in union and intimacy. So this is where everything started. And this condition, again, hemohydrosis, wouldn't have left him. That would have maintained, his, his disposition would have maintained in that same state all the way through the impending suffering that, mm -hmm. that Ryan Shields about to share with us. Um, yeah, so that's pretty intense. Mm -hmm. And... And, you know, considering that it stayed with him throughout the entire passion, uh, it's hard to consider. Mm -hmm. um, but the other, you know, even before the crucifixion, number one, he was beaten. He was crowned with thorns and he was whipped. Now, and even prior to that, the starvation of his absolutely. body, too. So even being held in captivity overnight, his dehydration and and the the level of you know, not being able to sustain himself in food is also a part of this. Yeah, uh, just unbelievable to imagine. Now, crucifixion was invented by, or invented, that's such a terrible way to say it, but invented by the Persians in about three to 400 BC. Um, and it was adopted by the Romans who saw it and took it to a higher level. And crucifixion was only reserved for the most hated enemies of the Roman Empire. A Roman citizen could not be crucified. That's why St. Paul was beheaded and Peter was crucified because it was viewed as so disgraceful and so painful and so barbaric. They would not even 
commit the act on one of their own citizens. Hmm. Now, Jesus not being a Roman citizen was, was condemned to death on the cross. But beforehand, they would typically whip or a person uh, with what's called the flagrum, right? And the Roman flagrum, there is examples of these to this day, and it is a brutal, brutal instrument. And this is the one that probably caused the most amount of wounds on Jesus. Now, we always have the devotion to the five wounds of Christ, right? The two hands, two feet, and the side. But according to multiple visions of saints, um, and most specifically St. Bernard of Clairvaux, that Jesus had specifically 5,266 wounds on his body over the course of the Passion, Mm -hmm. which includes all of the puncture wounds from the uh, The crown of thorns, Mm -hmm. and then all the wounds in his hands and Mm -hmm. his knees and on his feet from carrying the cross and falling. But the majority of these would have come from the beating and the whip. Now, the Roman flagrum was essentially a handle with long... Um, strips of leather tied mm-hmm. to it with fish bones or metal barbs attached to it. And there would be three to 10 to 12 or more at the end. So it's almost like a 12 prong whip. Yeah. And they would, and they whipped that him. dug into your skin. This would have essentially filleted his back and removed the skin from his back. Yeah. Um, yeah and you can see, like you said, in some, and some statues, you can see the 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 picture of that, and it's uh, it's pretty yeah. profound. I mean, if you look at the Shroud of Turin, you can you can see the amount of those wounds mm-hmm. on there. Or if you look at some of the artwork, I mean, it shows the the devastating effect that this um, this this whipping would have had. Even for Mel Gibson's Passion, I think that's got to be one of the most difficult scenes to watch in the entire <sighs> film. Yeah, the part where it gets stuck mm-hmm. and they have to pull out is incredibly difficult to consider mm-hmm. happening to anyone, let alone to uh, the spotless victim that our Lord was. Mm-hmm. Um, no. That's the greatest tragedy of it all is that he's, he was pure and without sin. And this is the end that he faced. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Was the, um, you know, there was that scene where, his, his, where Mary was wiping up his blood. Was was she there present during that time when, when he was being? You know, according to that vision of Catherine and Emmerich, she was, but it's not recorded anywhere, so it's it's all private revelation. Mm-hmm. But the the meeting along the Via Crucis is recorded, yes. and the fact that yeah. Mary was at the foot of the cross. So it's very likely that she would have been there, mm-hmm. but it's private revelation, as yeah. as the cat the cat the church uh, you know qualifies it. So after starvation, after dehydration, crowning with thorns and a a whipping that would likely, even without the crucifixion, would kill most people. Um, Just the the loss of blood and the shock the body went through and the infection, nine out of ten people would not survive that level of a whipping. Right. Um, But then on top of that, he was then forced to carry the crossbar of his cross or the entire cross. You know, depending on we we have we have some of the cross, don't we? They're, Absolutely. They're, so, I mean, was, was this a, a extremely heavy oh, yeah. instrument? It would have been incredibly heavy because uh, to be able to support the weight of a body, to be able to be held aloft and or put up erect, it would have to be number one thick enough to be able to hold the weight of a human body <clears throat> in the air without buckling, and hold the weight of the body on it vertically without breaking. So, this would have been an incredibly heavy heavy piece of wood. Yeah. And large nails too that would go through. Yeah. Um, so carrying this, you know, um, with, after having had that scourging, you know, the, the body and the skin after bleeding like that and being whipped, are going to start to blood's going to flow. It's going to start to coagulate and create clots. But every time you're moving, you have this rough wood against your back and it is going to be peeling and pulling and rubbing on these wounds. Mm -hmm. The amount of pain this would have caused is enough to send any human being into it into into shock, shock yeah. and their body could absolutely shut down from that. Yep. The amount of strength and dignity our Lord had to be able to carry His cross after this treatment. The I, I don't think very few humans could comprehend 
what an ordeal that was. Yeah. To carry this, I think, two and a half miles to the, the point where he was going to be crucified. Yeah. I mean, I I remember uh, the Via Crucis being maybe a half of a mile in Jerusalem. Is mm-hmm. that just an abbreviated... Um, yeah, don't quote me on, on the distance of it, yeah. but the Via Crucis is... Not, it's not necessarily historical, but just because the city has changed over so the last 2,000 yeah. years. But some of the sites are very much known. Yeah. So, you, I mean, you definitely know, you know, where the Roman garrison was. You definitely yeah. know where Herod and uh, Pilate were. You know, where exactly Veronica was. I don't know if that's right. known from the things that exist to that day. Gotcha. You know, where the condemnation took place. And Calvary. And Calvary is pretty is it's pretty very clear. well established. You know, that's, that's very established. Yeah, I always think, like, um, he... It, you know, I, when I meditate on the sorrowful mysteries and the carrying of the cross, like he, the cross is such a cent- central figure. It's, it's so meaningful. Um, it, it is the will of the father. It is, it is Jesus completely cooperating that just the, 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 the pain and the suffering and knowing that he had more to go and just the strength that, that he had to muster up to do this is just absolutely mm-hmm crazy it's it's incredible yeah um and and the the witness of saint simon of cyrene and giving that help to our lord uh, and the the women of jerusalem um you know they i don't think saints uh, simon of cyrene i don't even know if he's considered a saint as mm-hmm. a matter of fact i know that his his children were but it's never in my mind been clear if saint si- well i keep saying it simon of cyrene was actually a saint because he did not, he was not part of the Jesus movement. He was just conscripted from the crowd coming in for the Jewish festivals. So, Mm -hmm. but in either respect, but it's very clear that his family converted and and came to believe very strongly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, What's the tradition about his children? I mean, let's, I think they're even mentioned the gospels that, you know, the sons of Simon, they had converted, but the, you know, we don't know about St. That's the third time. <laughs> Simon of Cyrene. Maybe that's meant to. Maybe, maybe, that's maybe meant to be. yeah. Maybe someone's telling me something. <laughs> <laughs> but to, to consider for a moment his his medical condition of hemohydrosis, then to the point of like losing twenty percent of his blood and very likely going into hypovolemic shock, and this is when the body loses twenty percent of oxygen and and the blood supply. And it depletes everything, and and the heart stops pumping uh, because it, it's preventing pumping more blood, which results in even less reaching the cells and the overall strength of the body. Um, and it's a vicious cycle. So you know the the hemodrosis that that we were talking about that's going to remain with you. It's going to keep your your flesh very very tender. Then all that gets ripped open. And now you lose over 20% of his blood. You know, he's on the Via Crucis. He's moving. He's still bleeding. After the crowning of the thorns, he's still bleeding. I mean, this has got to be thoroughly, if that's just 20% of his blood for the hypovolemic shock. I mean, there, there'll be fluid building up around his heart. His his muscles will start to massively cramp from the lack of oxygen. His um, electrolytes will be completely depleted. The oxygenation, oxygenation of his blood is going to be at a critical level. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And He's going to be experiencing nausea, profuse sweating of blood, dizziness, confusion, loss of problems. consciousness, vision problems, and, mean, could, and can also vomit. So he could have been vomiting in that in that state too, which is very uh, related to hypovolemic shock. Um, and this could also create moments of, of gagging and possible suffocation in and of itself. But he was able to endure that period of suffering moving along the Via Crucis. Although those those could be very well in those moments that he was overcome by those symptoms and those mm-hmm. are the reason that he fell along the Via Crucis. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. He could have fell and, and vomited and was very disoriented mm-hmm. and, you know, or confused. Com- his body would have completely given out and... Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's so barbaric. Mm -hmm. And to think of those three falls in that manner, like what was, what motivated those falls? 
the excruciating suffering, breaking open that excruciating suffering, what could have potentially been happening to him scientifically and medically, you know, as his body was going through all of this is, is something fruitful to reflect on. Yeah. And the mm-hmm. cramping in his muscles. I mean, a, a normal person could probably barely stand. Yeah. Let alone um, carry an incredibly heavy piece of wood yeah. and walk with it. So, I mean, obviously he's going to fall multiple times and it would have been likely that he would have physically required St. Simon of Cyrene, of Cyrene to assist him because it, it would have been difficult mm-hmm. for him to feasibly make it up Calvary without it. Yeah, and then Veronica wiping his face. I mean, I can't imagine the amount of blood and, and the, the loss of vision you know, just simply from having to carry that cross with that, with both hands and not being able mm-hmm. to wipe his face. You know, and, and typically the Romans would tie the crossbar of the cross would be the part that you would carry typically. Uh, we, you know, we typically see the full cross, but yeah. it really would have been almost like a, the like, a mortise and, to the ground. like a mortise and tenon joint yeah. where there's, you know, and they place the cross beam across it. But his arms would have been tied to it. So if he fell, he would not have been able to brace himself or break his fall if that was the case. He would have fallen with nothing to prevent him from going face first Mm. into the ground, which would have caused additional crazy amounts of pain. And How he even got up to Mount Calvary blows my mind. Yeah. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah, that's what I was saying is like I just just can't. I can't fathom the amount of strength that he had to muster to 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 complete this this work for him to know. muster up enough strength to to even endure the path and then to come to some type of conscientious ability of expressing to the women of Jerusalem what he expressed to them yeah. of interacting with his mother and saying behold mother i make all things new huh. you know for him to have the recollected spirit spiritual vision of what he was doing in the process of going through all of these medical conditions in in the flesh, going through the emotional and spiritual disposition of being abandoned by his closest and most intimate friends and and his apostles, rejected by all of the children of Israel, and now being led in this manner to the the point of being forsaken by the Father. Yeah. This is is just... the epitome of what the capacity of the human person that is redeemed in the person of Jesus Christ, he's redeeming humanity's fallen state. He is taking on the flesh and he's showing the very capacity of our ability to suffer with purpose. And he's saying, behold, I make all things new. This is why our suffering participates in what Christ accomplishes in that renewal. Yeah. yeah. And it's and it's a very hopeful thing that we have a God that's gone through this immense amount of suffering on so many different levels to 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 literally offer to us his his suffering as a way to unite to somebody who, you know, could be going through something that's just immeasurable to them. Mm-hmm. Mm. So According to that that vision and those multiple visions that I, I uh, spoke of earlier, uh, particularly of St. Bernard of Clairvaux, uh, with the 5,466 wounds that Jesus suffered, the multiple times in that, well, in that vision, St. Bernard asked Jesus, which of your wounds grieved you the most? Which one was the most painful? And in this vision, Jesus said that it was a shoulder wound that had hurt him the most likely from the scour- the scourging and that um, carrying the cross really mm, um, exacerbated, exacerbated that. it. Yeah. And now a really interesting thing is that St. Padre Pio, the stigmatist who bore the wounds, the five wounds of Christ. Um, one, one priest recalled when John Paul, when he was still Caro Votia went and visited him and Caro Votia asked Padre Pio, which of your wounds hurt the most, fully expecting that it was his going to be his side wound. But what Padre Pio told him was that it was his shoulder, a wound that no one could see and no one could treat that grieved him the most. Mm. So Padre Pio had other wounds too as well? That shoulder, he, Padre, according to this recounting, he told John Paul II, well, he was still a priest, that his shoulder wound, which was not visible, was the one that hurt him the most. Mm. The same as Jesus and same as Padre Pio. That's very Pio. interesting. And the, there was in St. Faustina's experience of suffering as well. She suffered the wounds of the stigmata, but they were not visible. Any of them were, none wow. of them were visible. Yeah. 
but she experienced the suffering of them. Well, Padre Pio, you could see blood. You could see that, but it, but it, but if you took the glove off, you could not see a physical wound. Mm. You but you see could the blood sometimes. Sometimes, mm, yeah. Okay. Wow, it's so mystical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. So then, after getting up Calvary, he would have been then nailed to the cross. He would have been stripped of his garments and. Typically, we'll see on our crucifixion that Jesus was wearing a loincloth. It's very likely that he was wearing nothing at all, wow. and that he was completely naked. Mm. And the humiliation of that, particularly for the Jewish people, who valued the um, modesty and the decency of at least covering up, at you know, um, who were there just like totally leading the charge. And, and there he was, nailed to, to a be cross, shamed, to be shamed, shamed yeah. completely naked. Wow. I mean. That's, can, could you even imagine that aspect of it? The, the psychological feeling of not being able to cover yourself up because your hands are affixed to something. And then you think about Adam and Eve, how they were naked in the garden. Right. And the first thing that they did in that sin was to cover themselves right. up. Mm -hmm. But there's a, that's a really great uh, point is because their sin caused them to want to cover up. But naked with shame, naked with shame. But Jesus bore all of our shame in nakedness and made it whole again and naked made it without redeemed. shame. Yeah. Which is something you don't consider enough. But to me, that's very just the, the indignity of that mm -hmm. is so typical of the room, the Roman brutality. Mm hmm. So he would. And, you know, in Passion of the Christ, how they had to pull his arm and that all he said you know, he already said his shoulder was hurting and that the, he had to, they had to extend the arms even further and pull it out of socket to get it to line up. Um, terrifying. So when when they did a crucifixion, they, they would pull your arm out of socket? That's well, it, pretty it, hard to do for... In, in the Passion of the Christ, that's what they depict, which would echo the vision of St. Catherine and Emmerich. Gotcha. Because... They had to get it to a certain point to line up with a pre-drilled hole, essentially. Gotcha. And his hand wouldn't reach, so they tied a rope around and yanked his arm in a socket so that it would reach that hole. Mm. Wow. Which mm. already his shoulder wound was the one that hurt him the most. And that would just completely lack any support in his arms, in his upper torso. Which to... is going to affect dramatically what happens later on yeah. in the crucifixion. Now, before we continue on this... Um, Let's let's take a little break. Um, tell everyone about our sponsors and um, how they can find out more about them. I'd be happy to. We are most grateful for our sponsors. And I have to first start with Hallow. Hallow is the number one Catholic meditation and guided prayer application in the App Store today. Be sure to visit Hallow because when you do, you'll see all sorts of prayer and meditation guided efforts that they have put together in a beautiful and most attractive way from Taze to Lexio Divina to rosary and to daily gospel reflections and so much more. This is a beautiful application that you should definitely have on your phone. And if you utilize this platform, you will truly be able to advance in not only your understanding of the Catholic tradition of prayer, but be able to cultivate that in your own practice uniquely to you. This number one Catholic meditation and prayer app is specifically out there for you to grow in your faith. We are so grateful for their work. We are so grateful for their sponsorship. And you should take a moment and check them out because they are truly at the very forefront of technological advancement and the new evangelization. So check out Hallow Catholic Meditations and Prayer App today. We want to tell you about our sponsor, Exodus 90. Exodus 90 is 90 days of prayer and asceticism, cold showers and devout prayer moving through the book of Exodus so that men could find greater freedom in Christ. This program is a tremendous program that over 20,000 men have already gone through, and you should consider becoming the very next member in this very powerful movement. Please consider to join Exodus 90 now. Check them out. You will not regret it. Ave Maria University, our sponsor, is an institution of higher learning in the Catholic tradition, and one that is very, very dear to me, as I am an alumnus and a graduate of 2008 from the new campus. We were part of the first graduating class, and it is 
awesome to see how much Ave Maria University has grown and has become not only the youngest Catholic institution, but one of the most powerful, driven in academics and faith. It is a university that appeals to all. And we'd like you to consider becoming a student at Ave Maria University, or if you know someone that is of age that may be looking at colleges and universities around the country, be sure to tell them about Ave Maria. There are over 30 majors. There's programs undergrad as well as postgrad, all the way up to PhDs in theology. You do not want to miss a chance to attend this university. It is surrounded by the oratory, this beautiful church in the middle of Ave Maria town, just 30 miles away from Naples and the beautiful beaches. It's in Southwest Florida, so the weather is beautiful. But the greatest thing and the most beautiful thing about the university is the community. The community life is a place where young people find belonging and most importantly, encounter Christ in the beautiful tradition of the Catholic faith. So check out Ave Maria University today. You won't regret it. All right. Thanks for that, Padre. Mm -hmm. So being affixed to the cross, the Romans would have typically used steel nails and these would have been likely about seven inches in length. Um, when looking at the historical record, they've only found very few actual historical artifacts of crucifixions of other victims of Roman crucifixion. But that those types of nails, pretty rough, but what typical of a Roman nail for construction and seven inches long would, be, would have been the case. Now, this nail would have been... A lot of times in crucifixion depictions, you'll see it through the middle of the palm. The middle of the palm, typically, well, it could not support the weight of a body. Right. Now, it could be, and a lot of times the Romans didn't even nail a person to a cross. They would just tie them to the cross. Because just tying somebody, their hands to a vertical cross, would cause the same type of effects that a crucifixion would cause without the nail. Mm -hmm. And that that mm -hmm. actually, that death would have taken... It would have been much quicker. Tying somebody's arms above their head on a cross, a person could die within 30 minutes. Um, but going right through the palm, unless t their arms were tied, would not have worked because they, they would have ripped the whole hand off. Yeah. But there was, a, there was a French anatomist and one of the pioneers of radiography. His name was uh, Etienne uh, Desto. And there's a, in his studies of the uh, human anatomy in the hand, the point where the Romans typically, and the Romans being masters of cruelty, would have known that there was a very particular spot in the human hand that could support the weight of the human body, um, and that's called distose space or distose point. And it's a small gap in between the small bones of basically the heel of the palm that could support it. So it would have been roughly be between between the pinky Thank and the, the ring finger and very far down on the hand, right about there in a gap between five bones that would support the weight of a human body. So if Jesus was not tied and went directly through the palm, the nail would have went right through here. Mm -hmm. Now, the issues that this causes medically is that there is an incredible amount of nerves in this area because that is where a lot of the nerves of the hand and the tendons meet. Right. So a steel nail going through here, number one, would have caused an absolute explosion of pain. And it would have continued, this nail would have continued to rub on those nerves, causing constant and unyielding and unceasing pain. Mm -hmm. It would have also have made the hands go completely dead. Yeah. And except that's for just the, pain. the And that's just the, the insertion of the nail, probably while he was laying down. Right. And not giving Bearing the pressure. His weight on it. Yeah, giving the pressure and the movement of raising him to the cross and then upholding his weight. That's right. Mm. So just the amount of pain there is unimaginable. Mm. That's just overwhelming just even listening to it. You know, my heart's just kind of deeply affected by this. So when they would have now his feet, the way that the Romans would have crucified someone's feet, it wasn't, it was again, it was very calculated. They wouldn't have just stretched your legs out and nailed them in an arbitrary fashion. They would have measured it out so that your knees would have bent at a 45, 45 degree, degree yeah. angle. Mm -hmm. Now, why is that? To press yourself up so you can breathe. It essentially is 
incredibly cruel, but it gives the person being crucified a sense of hope because at 45 degree angle, they're able to push up and prolong their suffering. Mm -hmm. That 45 degree angle gives enough to maximize the, to maximize the pain and the torture, but also to prolong how long a person would live on the cross. Which at length could could last anywhere from, you know, obviously hours to 10 days or, or more on occasion. 10 days. Depending, mm-hmm. depending on the level of the, the scourging they received, because most Tortured would have been before. Yeah. If they, they could live up to 10 days on the cross. Hmm. Yeah. And like, you know, you say false hope. It's just like the body's natural reaction to it, that is going to want to, 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 right. to stand up. So when the cross was elevated. <clears throat> He would have been nailed through the stove space. Mm-hmm. He would have been nailed either through the side of the foot, going through the top of the foot with um, uh, kind of his feet straddling the beam of the cross or stacked on top of each other um, or with his palms down on the cross, the palms of his feet, the soles of his feet flat with the cross nailed through at a 45 degree which would have created his 45 degree knee or leg angle. Was there a block that maybe was there uh, on top of that? Mm. Sometimes I've seen that. There was not a block on his feet. There would have been a block oftentimes, essentially a mini seat. Again, the seat was there to give a, um, a pressure point for them to push no, off. No, no, that you could sit on almost. Oh, uh, okay. But it was again there to just give a false sense of hope to prolong the amount of, of, that a person would live on the cross. Ooh. These crucifixions were the billboards of Roman cruelty. They were done along the streets into the city so that people were coming would see, you do not mess with the Romans. Mm-hmm. And the longer the person lived and the longer people saw someone suffering, the more impact psychologically it had on these oppressed people. Yeah. So oftentimes in a crucifixion, there would have been a seat, very small, but just enough, like almost a ledge that would give even the tiniest bit of respite but it was placed in such a way that if you sat on it, you couldn't breathe. So you'd have to pull yourself up. But then if you sat down to get rust on that, then it caused pain mm-hmm. or torture in another way. It was almost like a domino effect of if you try to get respite by pulling yourself up, your hands are going to hurt, and you, but you can breathe. But if you go back down and get some rest and sit, you're not able to breathe. Mm. So calculating all of this from the Garden of Gethsemane all the way up to the Via Crucis, all the abandonment, emotional, spiritual, physiological suffering that Jesus is enduring. Now he's on the cross. He's been nailed through the most torturous locations of his hands and his feet. And he's, he has the ability to breathe, but to even think about, you know, the vomiting, the, the, the nausea, the, the sickness, the lack of vision, lack of vision, all the confusion, all of that stuff, all the, the all the blood, the thirst that he had, all of that coming up to this very definitive moment where he could look out with the greatest of clarity and express father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That type of strength, that type of vision and ability to speak that into the world where we celebrate the forgiveness of God the Father, we celebrate the forgiveness of our Savior Jesus Christ drawing us into this relationship with the Father is altogether the greatest mystery of our salvation, the greatest mystery that this love is far beyond all telling. And this is the love that has attracted each of us. One, to maybe that you're listening to this podcast, but the love of Jesus that has emanated throughout history from the moment of his crucifixion to this very day that you're reflecting on his, on his suffering. Yeah. Mm. Then we just think about <clears throat> the difficulty of forgiveness in our own life with people that, you know, have harmed us and how I can't imagine, um, can't imagine this 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 act of forgiveness, and especially with, with his physical state. It's a great point. You know, how many of us just our our ego is wounded, and we mm-hmm. want to dismiss somebody, or somebody's on a, a different political side, and we want to just dismiss somebody. That's not even anywhere near the suffering that that Jesus articulates, and he was forgiving them from this yeah. cross, and, yeah. and the the not knowing what they do. Right? It's mm-hmm. um, you know, I I think about uh. 
you know, I think it's Paul. He says that we fight principalities. We don't fight people, Mm -hmm. that there's principalities that other people have been harmed and they pass that along to Mm -hmm. others Mm -hmm. unbeknownst of how merciful they, they could be to somebody to change their perspective, this divine mercy that you can participate in with your Lord to forgive others. Mm -hmm. You know, you think about that and some of the most powerful moments in my life were just the realization that I had to forgive other people Mm -hmm. because, you know, resentment or something like that. It's like drinking poison and waiting for somebody else to die. You know, it just, it just eats your own heart up and it it Mm -hmm. takes you away from God. And this act right here alone, I mean, I can't imagine forgiving somebody for, for this. And that's true. They're mocking him. They're mocking him. They're mocking this. And, and, and what you just said is so important to, to say, maybe this person most likely doesn't even know how it's affected me. Yeah. You know, and they don't know that their actions or their deeds have affected me and hurt me in this, in this way. Yeah. You know, and that's why a lot of times you just even confessing to somebody, this is how I felt like this is, this is how you made me feel. Yeah. And, you know, seeking apology or, or, or asking for forgiveness is so important to the life of, of a Christian. So important to the life of a follower of Christ and to realize that it is our actions that have placed Jesus on that cross. We all participate in the mystery of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ as sinner. Now, on the cross, what would Christ have died from? Now, a lot of times you'll hear that it's asphyxiation because the cross, again, the way the arms are held above and the way that they're stretched out, um, number one, being on the cross for a, a victim of the crucifixion, their arms at the end of the ordeal would typically be five to seven inches longer than they were before because of the pooling of the tendons, the dislocation of the shoulders, trying to support the weight, trying to pull yourself up over and over again, the <clears throat> lack of uh, hydration and electrolytes depleted from the body, the arms completely sag and lose all structural integrity. <clears throat> Typically, a person would die of as- asphyxiation on the cross. Um, Meaning that they would suffocate. They would suffocate. Mm-hmm. Basically, their body would... Uh, they would not be able to continue breathing. It, it has something to do from with the lo- rib cage or something coming out and putting pressure on the lungs right. in a way that is abnormal. And the way that the body hangs kind of slightly <clears throat> forward because of the 45 degree angle, the chest hangs slightly forward, the arms slightly back and pulling yourself up. But that can, you can't keep that up forever. Mm-hmm. Fluid builds up in your lungs. You can no longer draw enough oxygen and you essentially drowned in the open air. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the science, I would say, and I think a lot of people who have evaluated this, even, you know, coroners and um, biologists, they would say that it's likely that he actually died of heart failure. And there's something very telling about that. So heart failure, um, we we talked about that earlier, about that uh, hypervolic shock that would have built up fluid around his heart. This is kind of the same thing of congestive heart failure, but this would have been accelerated by the amount of, of um, traumatic. traumatic ordeal yeah. he went through. And the reason that I would posit that he died of heart failure, um, number one, it seems more fitting that he his heart gave out for the world. But it's very telling that the five wounds of Christ are the hands and the palms, but also the side. Now... The Romans would do that. So when somebody died of crucifixion, if no one claimed the body, it would be left there on the cross or they would cut it down. The The bodies that they have found of the crucified um, Israelites at the time, they would have just typically chopped off the feet and the hands, got rid of the body, and that was it. But they did allow people to claim the bodies. That was typically what they did. Now, if you were to claim the body... The Romans had to ensure that the person was dead. So they would break the legs? No. Mm. The reason that they would break the legs of somebody mm. is because that would accelerate the asphyxi- asphyxi- asphyxiation yeah. process mm-hmm. because you can no longer push up no. and breathe. Mm-hmm. So because of what was going on when Jesus died and the earthquake and the darkness and the temple veil splitting in two, it says that they broke the legs of the, the two of St. Dismas and the unrepentant sinner on his sides. 
that would have caused him to die, like I said, with the with the crucifixion with the hands above the head, likely within 20 to 30 minutes. But Jesus had, was already dead, but they do not let, the Romans would not let um, the crucified person's family take the body unless they verified the death. And they would do that by sticking a lance between the inner space, between the fifth inner space between the ribs and going up um, to pierce the pericardium, um, which is essentially the heart area. Mm. Now, the reason and if there was fluid around the heart, the water that the, surrounds the, the heart. blood in the water would flow out mm -hmm. because of the because uh, he likely died from heart failure. Essentially, the the fluid would have intermingled with the blood. And when they pierced the pericardium through the rib, through his side, that's when water and blood would have flown out, which would have said this man is truly dead. Yeah, but what about the water in the lungs, right? Is, well, it's fluid. Lungs... It's not the same. Okay. It's not the same. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. It would be a different fluid. Yeah. Another mm -hmm. thing, too, is that um, if you're suffocating, I think there were some some more words that he said before he passed away. Absolutely. So if you're suffocating, it, it, you know, the gasping and things, it's very difficult he, to he speak. Would, it would have been incredibly difficult for him to speak. Yeah. And that's why typically... Speak clearly, you know. The last words um, that he speaks on the cross are very short. And that's yeah. why they're also so venerated, yes. you know, like the last words of Christ yeah. Yeah. and, and to really spend time meditating on those when he entrusts his mother to all of us, yeah. you know, and, and entrusts to John, the beloved, you know, this is your mother. But it, I mean, even more so he's still forgiving people yep. in that moment as mm -hmm. well. Yeah, I mean, the, and the repentant dismiss, right. you know, like. Today you will be with me in the kingdom. Like yeah. that is so. I, I special. love Saint Dismas so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I just I, I love the fact that um, that that God even his his mercy is so profound and mysterious that even on a deathbed of somebody who's lived such a. I was talking to the guy last night and and you know he's talking about his father and how just uh, you know against religion and and but. But I, I was just saying, like, you know, you never know if somebody's about to die. Mm -hmm. Like, you, you, you've always got that opportunity, like Dismas. You I know? would say, technically, wouldn't St. Dismas be the first declared saint? Mm -hmm. I mean, that would well, be Well, scripturally first. speaking, he's the only one that we can really honestly say, yeah. you know, well, that Elijah, is clar Moses. clarity. But with clarity, like Jesus saying, you will be with me in yeah. the kingdom. Yeah. This day. This day. Like, that. that is something... I always love that one... One of the thieves asked to be taken down, and the other one asked to be taken up. Mm -hmm. It's such a distinction in thought, mm -hmm. and it's such a telling way of what God values. Mm -hmm. um, the seven last words on the cross were, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Um, what he said to Dismas today, seven statements. They're not oh, words individually. Oh, okay. Today you will be with me in paradise to Dismas, um, to John and Mary, woman, behold thy son, son, behold thy mother. Uh, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. Um, I thirst, which was very dear to um, Mother, Mother Teresa. Teresa. Mm. Um, it is finished, consumatum est. And then, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Mm -hmm. Those are the seven things that he said from the cross. I know we're not talking about this, but in what context? He says, Father, for, no, excuse me. Uh, my uh, God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? It's a psalm. Okay. It's, it's, he's praying. It's a Psalm. Um, it, I believe it's Psalm 34, I want to say, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but it's, it's one of the, the Psalms of lament mm -hmm. and uh, Jesus as a prayerful man would have prayed. He would have prayed this just like people now, you know, us, I mean, we would say the, you know, we would want viaticum. We would want, um, the inarticular Relief. mortis, you know, we yeah. would say these prayers, you know, if I was knew I was dying, I'd be saying our fathers and Hail Marys, right? But in the context of this time, that would have been a prayer very common to people who knew they were approaching death, mm, which okay. is that psalm, mm, that, wow. that lamenting psalm. So it wasn't him saying, oh, what, what's going on here? Where's God in all of this? Right, right, he, right. But it was a, it was that's a prayer. That's why I ask, because yeah. I mean, the whole that's thing a, That's was... a common misconception. Yeah. But again, yeah, so Jesus would have died from essentially congestive heart failure, from the buildup of fluid around the pericardium. And we know that because that is a very, that is a symptom of that hypervolic shock. Mm -hmm. That is a symptom of crucifixion. 
and with the blood and water, that's a telltale sign of that. So he died of a broken heart. But this, the mm-hmm. spiritual reality of the dark night of the soul, something Mother Teresa or St. John of the Cross experiences, and, you know, the sense of being forsaken, you know, the whole sense of not receiving the consolation that comes yeah. from God's love in prayer, or the insight, that's precisely what Jesus himself is facing. So it's not just he's doing a blind ritual that this is what we've been doing, you know, and as we prepare for death. That could be a part of it, but no, Jesus is like entering into different caverns and capacities of human suffering so that he is literally accomplishing through the entirety of what the human person can face. He is doing that in one single swoop of a redemptive act to make suffering redemptive. And, and that's why what Mother Teresa went through, it wasn't in vain. What St. Saint John, Saint John of the Cross went through wasn't in vain. So what a lot of you are going through is not in vain. Yeah, it's not in yeah. vain. So even if you are not experiencing the consolation of God, it doesn't mean, hey, just give up on, on this journey. No, progress. Because it, the insights that come from these seven last statements, the, the, you know, the establishment of the church and the sacramental life of the church that pours out from his heart and blood and water and the birth of the church in that respect of the sacraments and the Blessed Virgin Mary being titled as mother and we as children is something that, that was accomplished through all of that. So don't be surprised that God wants to accomplish something through your suffering as well. Absolutely. Yeah, I and even like, even like, uh, receiving his blood from the chalice, you know, they, they put water in there, a holy water in there. And it's like, you're, you're literally drinking this, 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 what, what killed him, you know, and his, and his and blood. It, it, so it's his, it's his soul. <clears throat> it's his humanity and divinity with, with the blood and the, with the wine and the water. But it also, you're right. Is that, that is what would have flowed from the cup yeah. from the side of him, which, yeah. you know, according to some tradition, St. Joseph of Arimathea would have caught in the la- in the Holy Grail. Mm-hmm. Um, I think so. You know, we're, this is this is Holy Week. We're coming up on Good Friday. And, you know, I think this episode might help you to reflect on what our Lord really experienced. Um, when you're doing your Stations of the Cross this Friday, uh, which I encourage every everyone to do, it's I, I it's. It's one of the best devotions and most um, humbling things you can do on Good Friday is the Stations of the Cross, whether it's in prayer or if you have, you can go to your church or if there's somewhere that has them to, to walk and do them. But to remember how absolutely brutal this was and what he went through uh, for your salvation and out of love for you, um, I think it's very important. Mm-hmm. It really yeah. is. Mm-hmm. And then one other devotion I wanted to bring up, I mentioned that f- those, those visions of the 5,466 wounds of Christ. Um, St. Gertrude the Great, she had a devotion where it venerated each of the wounds that Jesus would have suffered in this vision. And it was 15 Our Fathers every day for a year would then be one Our Father for every wound that Jesus suffered during the Passion. Mm. And it's a really great devotion that 15 Our Fathers a day um, in reparation and, and in veneration of the wounds of Christ— um, it's, it's not a hard devotion to do, but it's a very, uh, evocative and a very powerful way to remember the passion. And it takes a full year to accomplish. Year, yeah. And you could start that in good Friday and finish it next good Friday. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll do that. If you guys do that starting good Friday, Beautiful, man. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. my brothers and sisters, we thank you so much for joining, joining us in this very solemn episode of the Catholic talk show, reflecting on the crucifixion of Jesus and what he actually went through and breaking that down scientifically. Hopefully this gives you a greater lens to look into the very mystery of our salvation that Christ won for us and to realize most sincerely that you are not suffering alone, that Christ desires and his passion is to suffer for you so that you don't have that sense of loneliness and abandonment. Christ is with you. Be strengthened in this beautiful season, in this Holy Week, leading up to Christ's wonderful victory over the cross and the grave that he has resurrected from the tomb. Let us draw close to the great central mystery of our faith, and let us draw close together in our faith so that we may walk together. 
My brothers and sisters, we want to give a big thank you to all of our followers on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We want to give a big thank you to our patrons who support us financially at patreon.com forward slash the Catholic talk show. We want to say a big hello and a greeting uh, to all of our YouTube subscribers. If you have not yet subscribed on YouTube, please go there and subscribe and click the bell so that everything that we produce is drawn up in your feed. And my brothers and sisters, we will see you next week as we celebrate the Easter joy of Jesus rising from the tomb. God bless.